Good evening, everybody. I'm just uh, uh, put a message out to see if Anne's going to make it or not, so we'll hear back from her hopefully in a few seconds. But I want to thank you all for coming out. And is this thing loud enough you can hear? Okay. So what we wanted to do is, uh, all we're going to do is introduce our speakers for tonight. But uh, what this has to do is that with a lot of things that are going on with the legislation over the last year. And uh, so there, there was a handout if anybody can get one. There's one in the back. But it's for the major public acts and what the impact is to the state of Connecticut. And there are some things that relate to the town of Plainfield or any town for that matter. So um, I'll try to do the best I can to answer if you have a question related to Plainfield. But I'd like to introduce tonight um, one of our speakers. And this is uh, Representative Brian Lanoon. Uh, thanks, uh, Kevin. Can everybody hear me all right? Or Okay. Now you might um, want to turn, turn it up a little more. Then he doesn't have to right. eat it. All right, how's that? That's best. Again, I want to apologize to everybody. Uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I was under the weather and did not make the Saturday uh, legislative uh, update, so I do uh, my apologies again for, for that. Uh, just for a note for housekeeping, uh, the Office hours that I had uh, that I did prior to the COVID shutdown, or we're unable to do that in person. Uh, that is uh, going to be starting back up. Uh, it's at Slater Library, North Main Street, Jewett City. That is going to be every month. Excuse me, the, first, the second, fourth Mondays of every month. That's going to be starting September 13th. So uh, again, open door policy to any uh, constituent from the 45th district. Uh, it's a first come, first serve basis. So. Anybody has any kind of issues or uh, problems, anything you want to discuss with me in person, more than welcome to come in during that time and we can have that conversation. Uh, you can also be uh, accessible by email. My home phone number is published. And I encourage you to reach out anytime. Um, as I have um, said numerous uh, times uh, before, and I can't emphasize this enough, don't assume because a, somebody's a, a state representative, a state senator, an elected official, that we know more about a particular issue or topic or even an individual bill more than you do. Um, you know what those interests are. You, you a lot of them to understand them very, very well. Uh, any given session, we have any, uh, thousands of bill concepts and proposals that are um, uh, moving around very, very quickly. So there's a, make sure you guys reach out to us and tell us what's, uh, what's important to you, what matters to you, what you want to see addressed. And a lot of times educate us on that as well. Um, and I, I, uh, I do. I have an outline of some of the uh, good and the bad and the ugly that we have seen this past session. Um, I don't know if we're going to go right into that. Or I have, uh, do, you, do you want to introduce yourself first? Do you want to just go right into that? Okay. Um, so the uh, I guess I'll outline the, some of the good, positive stuff first. Uh, unfortunately, that's a little less than the bad, but I will uh, just touch on that very, very quickly. I think, first of all, the, there's going to be expansion of the uh, crisis pilot program. This is, a, this is a program, it's a pilot program that had started in Troopy region, uh, essentially in one county of the uh, state police. Um, it's to address uh, opioid, the opioid overdose as well as uh, mental health um, type issues when the police are dispatched or called to those types of uh, responses. A uh, mental health clinician, a Demis clinician, is embedded right inside um, the uh, True B region. And uh, the, uh, the police officer, if they decide there's going to be a committal, some type of mental health uh, follow up, some type of uh, treatment, that, that that clinician um, does the follow up with the person and try to get them into the appropriate pipeline. It's been very successful since its uh, first year uh, in 2017. And we're on that, the 45th district. Uh, we kind of, we rely right on where half of the district has it, the other half up here up north does not. Uh, also, uh, municipal departments can also latch on and utilize this program if they want to as well. Uh, so it was a, uh, I worked for uh, several years, since my first year in the legislature, to try and get this up north, get this into um, the Troop D region. The, uh, my, my caucus, the House Republican caucus, liked the idea of crisis so much, we actually made it a caucus initiative to try to roll this out across the entire uh, state of Connecticut. Um, it ended up where it is going to get expanded into Troop D, and we're also going to have a task force to look at how, the best way to 
uh, roll this out to the rest of the state. Um, there's also the uh, payment in lieu of taxes uh, pilot formula change that um, is going to benefit uh, the town of Ballantown, uh, one of my towns in the district. Um, over 70% of the land mass in the state of uh, in, in Ballantown is uh, state owned, it's owned by the state of Connecticut. So there's a very limited uh, ability for the town to grow its, um, its revenue, to grow its, um, its grid list. And the, to me, if you own 70% of anything, you have 70% of the responsibility. And there was a new uh, pilot formula, which is far from perfect, that creates three different tiers. And this actually will place uh, Wallentown in the top tier uh, for, for reimbursement. And uh, I think that's very, very important uh, to the town of Ballantown. Uh, we also passed in the House, I co-introduced the co-welfare, uh, a bill with uh, Representative Dubitsky you know, from the 47th District to look at alternatives in the electric distribution market. Uh, we saw and learned all too well in 2020 uh, with the Eversource rate hike that had happened. Put, placing that on the hard worker backs of the men and women of our district uh, and throughout Connecticut. And uh, in addition to that, we, uh, with that rate hike, the uh, we uh, power was knocked out in good parts of our district for over two weeks. I was one that did not have power for two weeks. Many others in the district uh, did not as well, in addition to other places in the state. Um, our, we need to look at creating a more competition in the uh, electric distribution market, looked at alternatives. Uh, the a lot of the uh, public utilities, so Joe and City, Norwich, for example, restored the power relatively quickly, very quickly, uh, performed very, very well. So we want to look at ways to, um, to create that competition. So we had put in a bill for it to establish that task force, look at what the cost would be for a public utility if they wanted to expand their catchment zone. Um, if for example, what, what the hard costs would be for the infrastructure, for the poles, for the, for the wires, and be able to look at that all over in depth. I think it's very important. Uh, have, make sure we have the right people on that task force to get back to us. Um, it was called in the House, it passed the House, I believe, unanimously, and uh, it, died. it was not called in the Senate. So that's going to be one of my top priorities, trying to bring that back in 2022 to try and get that. Um, for us to finish on and get that task force together uh, quickly to come back to us with, with answers. Um, the, uh, the final bill that made it quite far, again, very disappointed, it did not pass. Uh, something that's very important to all five of my towns is the uh, volunteer uh, firefighter and EMS stipend. Uh, many, one of the um, incentives that a lot of the volunteer departments use to try and attract volunteer firefighters, volunteer EMS personnel, is a annual stipend check. Nobody's getting rich on this. The average check is probably $1,500. And they, then once the, uh, the, the check is caught, the, it's, a, it's a 1099 that's used, and a, a good amount of that check is clawed back through state and federal taxes. So right now, with the current law, the first 600 uh, under federal law is, is exempt. Uh, we, we raised that we tried to raise that to 1500 it uh, passed the public safety committee uh, it, it passed the uh, finance committee uh, and it was not called um, to the house floor so we want to make sure we try to get that call this year it's a very it's very very important to help protect and preserve our volunteer departments that that equates to uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of dollars in potential savings to keep a uh, a department uh, a volunteer as opposed to going to a full paid, a full time department. So, and also to certainly recognize those first responders that get those calls at home in the opportune times, in the middle of the night, uh, during supper, uh, that, that are rising from the occasion. So, those are a few of the bills that I think were, were certainly positive. Uh, there are several here that are um, unfortunately are not. Uh, for example, the um, highway use. Uh, Tax on trucks, they're going to be taxed in trucks, depending on how much they weigh, uh, so much per mile. Uh, these, these trucks are certainly not carrying anything in the back of them. This is what's carrying our food, our clothing. Um, our country uh, runs on, on an 18-wheeler, and there, it's estimated that in Connecticut, over the average food bill for the average family in our state 
is going to increase by $500 a year. Um, you know, th this was, I think, a fancy, this is another fancy way for a toll, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, there's good, they're going to be putting much, much more pressure on our trucking industry. They have to be, not only the, the cost of the, um, of the fee itself and the, the highway need the tax itself, but every month they have to uh, turn in a, a form uh, showing how many trucks they have, how many miles they want, uh, log in all this, all these things. Time is money. If somebody's going to have to record all this, document all this, turn it into the Department of Revenue Services. And certainly something me and uh, uh, Ann fought very hard on in the Children's Committee and on the House floor was the attack on parental rights that we're seeing this past session. I've never seen anything like it. Um, it's uh, absolutely unbelievable. Uh, starting with a bill that came out of, uh, it was an aircraft carrier bill, as we call it, uh, which piles a bunch of different bills into one big omnibus bill. Uh, one of them was called SB2, which originated in the Children's Committee. Again, something me and Ian fought against very aggressively. Uh, this, essentially, one of the major troubling parts of this bill to me, is you can, somebody can take a child for mental health counseling, for mental health treatment, without you, for an unlimited amount of uh, times, with an unlimited amount of services, and you can't even, you're not even going to be told, or you don't even have to be notified as a parent. Uh, I find that extremely uh, concerning. We do not know who these, necessarily who these people are who's taking your child. You may not know who they are, and you don't know who they're talking to and what they're talking about. Um, I would want to know, if I was a parent, I would want to know that my kid's going for um, counseling, for mental health counseling. That needs to be brought out and known as a parent. Um, also, there's the uh, uh, explanation of benefits. If you or one of your dependents go for treatment for any given medical issues, you get a, uh, your insurance is billed, they sent you the explanation of benefits, telling you exactly what it was you were treated for or your children. Now, kids as young as uh, uh, five years old, from what I was hearing from some of the uh, question and answer and dialogue that took place on the house floor, uh, can, they can take that child for treatment uh, and or to get some kind of medical procedures, anything from abortion, mental health treatment, all these different issues. And you're not even going to, you, you don't get the explanation of benefits, you don't get the EOB. That's going to go to wherever the child or whoever God knows is taking your child to, for, for treatment, wherever they dictate it's going to go. So it's, again, it's taken the parents out of the uh, driver's seat. Uh, another issue, I think that Ann did a great job starting this 17-hour uh, debate on the uh, House floor, was the uh, fighting to preserve the religious exemption and fight to preserve parental rights for the vaccine, uh, for a vaccine exemption. There is, I believe, 74, I know Ann has the exact number, list of vaccines that are on the schedule that a child is required to take to go to school. Um, if a parent has a strong religious exemption under the uh, under what the law was prior to this passage, you could take a religious exemption for uh, that particular vaccine uh, or any vaccine you found objectionable for religious reasons. Uh, the bill uh, before us that was passed is signed quickly into law by the governor takes away that religious exemption. So essentially they say, no, um, you, you have to, you, you're, you're forced to get your child injected with a, a list of 74 vaccines. Um, one issue that was particularly troubled to me, uh, that I was very troubled with this legislation, is the, um, the prior law, again, the, the ultimate check on this was the religion, was the, uh, the religious exemption, putting the parents in the driver's seat if they have an objection to any new vaccine that's added to the, to the schedule. Um, if a CDC, CDC, for example, makes a recommendation on a future vaccine, uh, DPH would then make the recommendation to, the, uh, to a committee of 18 legislators. In the, between the House and the Senate, there's 187 of us. There's 18 that review it, uh, the Regulations Review Committee, during the Regulations Review process. If the majority of them um, say yes, it becomes, it now gets added to the schedule. Um, again, when you guys have, you guys used to have the ultimate check as parents, where if you ultimately objected to a new vaccine added to the schedule, you were the ultimate check on government. 
Now the parents are out of the equation, essentially, and they're forced to vaccinate their children. Only 18 out of 187 of us are going to have something to say about that, have that check on what DPH uh, uh, will try to dictate to, uh, to everybody. So most of us who are not on that committee, uh, on the uh, uh, Regulations Review Committee, you guys come to us about any new future vaccine, who knows what that would be, and you say we have objections to that. There is nothing I can do, essentially nothing I can do as your elected representative. Uh, there was an amendment that was um, authored by uh, Representative Dauphine and Senator Summers, which would, would require the full legislature, the House and the Senate, to have to, to vote on that new vaccine. Um, I, I called that amendment on the House floor. Unfortunately, it, it failed, uh, almost nearly on the party lines. And um, so we're, we're stuck with now this, uh, this process where uh, 18 people are going to uh, have to consent. Not the whole 181, 87 of us. Um, there, there is also there is an attack on our pregnancy care centers, women who have uh, an unplanned pregnancy that are oftentimes young, on their own, uh, scared, going through one of the biggest, facing a, a crisis, and they don't have anywhere to turn. This is that court the storm. There are people there that care for these women, that uh, help to get them uh, uh, health care benefits. Uh, give them uh, parenting classes and work with these women and guide them through um, the, uh, the process of the pregnancy and stay in touch with them even after they have the baby. And uh, there was uh, the, uh, the Women's Center of Eastern Connecticut, of uh, William Yannick, Jeremy Bradley, who's the executive director, a constituent of mine. They do phenomenal work. Uh, they've, been, uh, they've been in service since the, uh, the 1980s. You see, there's, I believe, 26 of these uh, care centers throughout the state and have done just marvelous, marvelous work. And now the, uh, the, the legislature, the last few years, have been trying to pass a bill and they've now succeeded. And it's unfortunately now law, which these nonprofits, a lot of these faith based organizations, are going to be bound by the full power of the Attorney General's office, where they can call it, quote, deceptive practices. Women feel deceived that by going to one of these centers, they thought they were going to an abortion clinic and not a pregnancy care center. Um, there's, there has not been one complaint on record that we can find. There's been a hearing year after year after year. I don't think I'm going to speak more to this. Yet a member of the committee, I looked at the testimony, could not find one woman, one woman, one person that came forward and said, I was deceived, I was misled by going to one of these centers. What I could find and what I could uh, speak to is many, many witnesses coming forward saying how well they were treated, how well uh, they, uh, they were cared for by these, uh, by these people, these individuals, uh, and these, uh, these centers. So we're going to have the full power of the Attorney General. Somebody could, make a, a, could set up a situation, file a complaint. You're going to have the full power of the Attorney General and the full power of the government coming down on these nonprofits to have a huge strength of budget that's going to ultimately have to face uh, tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees trying to defend themselves potentially from maybe perhaps uh, very frivolous uh, complaints that start boiling up. So the, uh, in 2019, the numbers I saw was $2 million saved that they provided in free services for women to be over $2 million. Now if uh, these centers, a lot of them could be potentially at risk with um, this uh, new law in place, who's going to pick up that bill? Aside from the, because being morally wrong on half of these centers, it ultimately could fall back on the taxpayer. Um, there, 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 there's several more things here. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the implementer uh, that we passed uh, after the, uh, the, the regular session, we went back, we got called back into um, uh, that special session and there are several things in there I have certainly have an issue with. It's a thousand page bill uh, that was given to us uh, hours before we voted on it. Anybody that said they read the thing back to back and every word, I would like to come up to a light um, I, uh, this, <laughs> this stuff was, uh, it was uh, very, very troubling. Uh, everything in there from the corporate sur surtax that's going to be extended by another two years. Uh, you talk to our businesses, you talk to our corporations. They say the biggest problem with staying in the state of Connecticut is the uncertainty. 
We don't know what our taxes are going to be, what our regulations are going to be tomorrow. The unpredictability, and all of a sudden, the lies. The lies. That's what people are sick of. That's right. That's right. And uh, I, I agree with you, sir. And, they, and again, what did they do? They just extended it by another two years. So more, more unpredictability and something that was supposed to sunset, we're going to have for two more years. Um, felons are uh, going to have the right to vote that are, um, that are on parole or uh, fail to pay uh, restitution and they're still on parole will now have the right to cast the vote and decide um, who they're, who, who's going to uh, be representing the uh, state of Connecticut and uh, in Hartford or Washington and locally. Uh, also, there's going to be, they're going to require uh, the state to provide 90 minutes a day of free phone calls to people in prison, to our prisoners. Trying to figure out uh, an economically uh, feasible way is hard work in a citizen to pull your mother in California or uh, uh, wherever else. Uh, if you're if you're in if you're in prison, if you're in time, hard time, you get you get 90 minutes free on the uh, taxpayers' dime. Um, the uh, the marijuana bill. Uh, we also went into special session four. And I'll tell you, I voted I voted against it. I have several concerns about it. Uh, if this was just no, I'm sorry. Uh, and I'll just uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief on it. And then uh, the, the 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 biggest concern I have is they're they're picking winners and losers. Where they're going to be having licenses given out, permits given out to, uh, to decide who can manufacture it, who can transport it, who can grow it. And one of the one of the uh, the licenses it's going to be for people in disproportionately impacted areas. Who grew up in disproportionately um, impacted areas? That is going to be 50% of the licenses will be given to people who, again, grew up in disproportionately impacted areas. Regardless of who they are now, where they are now, uh, those are those are 50% of the licenses that are going to be given to them. Right? So, for example, billionaires like Howard Schultz or Larry Ellison, who grew up in one of these disproportionately impacted areas, but today is a billionaire, will have preference on these permits over you guys. Uh, that don't seem fair to me. Uh, that seems like cronyism at its very finest. And the idea of picking winners and losers is unacceptable. Uh, the, the other big concern for me on that is the, uh, the law enforcement uh, portion. Um, it's, it's in the law, they're gonna, they will tell you this, that you cannot smoke um, marijuana or cannabis and drive, and you have to be over the age of 21. However, for law enforcement, if they see somebody driving, you got a uh, you got a joint hanging out in your mouth, and you're driving down the road, the police officer cannot pull you over. That's not probable cause enough to, to pull that person over and stop them. Um, the other is if they if they stop a uh, a car full of teenagers. 16, 17 year olds, um, they smell the odor of marijuana, that's not probable cause. They cannot, under the current law, search the vehicle. Uh, again, absolutely ridiculous. There was a, there was several amendments that we, that we introduced, the, re, the, the Republicans on the House floor, we introduced amendments to try to allow police to do our, uh, their job, rectify those tears that failed, literally almost a party line vote. Um, and there was also a, an amendment to adopt uh, essentially the Vermont model that would take the state out of the marijuana business. Say, look, if we want to legalize, if you want to legalize this, we're going to get out of the business altogether. You want to, uh, you want to grow it, smoke it, whatever. It's, it, it, it's open to everybody. It's a, it's a level playing field. The state's out of the business, and it would, it would defer strictly to federal law. Again, that amendment failed. I apologize for going on here. But this is essentially some of the, uh, uh, the big ticket items that I've seen that I'm probably most troubled with. And uh, I will uh, turn it over to a very patient, uh, Ian Dauphine, and I'll be happy to take any questions you guys have. Thank you. Have you seen that new family reduction that's coming out of HX now? What is that all about? It's volunteer, but mandatory, and then not? It's not voluntary. It's mandatory. I know it's mandatory now, but next year it's not. No, it's mandatory. Every year. Every year it will be mandatory. Okay. 
So thank you for all coming this evening. My name is Ann Daphne. I represent the 44th District, so I have part of Clayfield with, with Brian. Um, thank you, Kevin, Kevin for coming, and, and both Brian. Brian is, is very thorough, and I think he covered every single issue that was really a highlight issue. Um, both Ke uh, Brian and I are, are on the uh, Conservative Caucus. So in case you don't know what that means, it means that um, the group of us, there's about 17 of us, that work very hard to limit the government's impact on your life. We, you know, most of the people that we hear from, and I'll, I'll speak for myself, but I think Brian would agree, are tired of the government intruding in their life. Um, and they believe that the government is, is failing us, right? They're, they're, it's a bureaucratic um, agency that's full of corruption, and we agree with that and um, little transparency, which we try to bring to you, but um, you know, we want that to be limited in your life, not bigger. And what we've seen in the past couple of terms is bigger government, um, bigger, uh, bigger, if you will, laws that will, will dictate to you what you can and can't do with your children. I think Brian highlighted that. What you can do in your own local towns, which we believe local towns should have um, the, uh, if you will, you know your town better than we do. There's um, 169 towns across the state. We don't function like Bridgeport. So we want to defer to you to make those decisions, and that goes back to Kevin. And one of the reasons why we invited Kevin to come is that some of these bills impact your town in a big way. And we wanted to hear from Kevin or have him here and available to answer questions to you. Kevin's done an excellent job. I can tell you I've called him several times for information and he's always, always, I know Brian would say the same, we've met with him several times. He's always been um, easy access. I think, I don't know that you sleep much, but he, I, can, I can call him pretty much any time of the day and he does respond. He knows what's going on. He's very in tune with what's going on in the legislature. He knows how these bills will impact each and every one of you. I don't know that I can add much to what Brian said, um, because Brian did a great job, at least when I stepped in, describing what's going on in Hartford and how it will impact you here in, in Connecticut. So I think going forward, um, I know I want less government in your lives. I, I believe that most of you, and for most of you that I hear from, believe that the government is failing us. And for us to add more to their plate when they're going to, it's, it's a big bureaucratic engine, right? And we keep putting more and more on them. And what do they do? It's, it's not transparent. It's failing us miserably. It doesn't address our small, small rural towns out here. And so we fight to make those decisions in your hands. And that's what I will continue to do. Um, I will let you ask questions. I know many of you here. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Um, so just ask away. Ask your questions about any specific bill you'd like. Yeah, thank you. Well, I didn't want to interrupt you when you were speaking, but I would like to just address what that gentleman said as well about okay. the, um, the family leave. Oh, family medical leave. Sure. Um, that, 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 that deduction you're seeing in your check, sir, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if you don't like that, get ready to see more taken out. Because this is a program that was set up for failure. The math does not work. Only in Hofford do we see math like that. Um, the, the deduction is a, a one half of 1% per person. Uh, that's what's taken out of your check. The benefit could be up to 12 weeks. So in other words, if somebody's making $50,000 a year, they can, right now they're deducting $250 a year from your check. However, if you want to utilize the benefit, it would be twelve thousand dollars for free. The, it, it does it does not it does not add up. Who pays so that? Uh, uh, you do. You do, sir. That's you. Employer? Uh, so no. That's how the employer match. Okay, so that's just an employee contribution. Correct. Right and now, when, it's they, when they file for the benefit, they're filing with the state. Correct. Okay, so what's the employer's job? In not just right now, just to, facil just to facilitate the co collection of the money. Uh -huh. I, you know, I believe, and I'm, I'm oh, not sure where Brian's... You want to facilitate the benefits, too? 
Well, they're going to facilitate the collection of the money. I believe that down the road they will have to participate in that in that um, funding, if you will. But right now they don't. Um, this was forced on you. Yeah. This is not an op this is not an option for you. This was forced on you. We had, you know, the Republican Party had offered a really, really good, robust plan that was very different than what was um, passed on the floor, and it was a voluntary program that would have allowed for those that wanted to participate to participate, um, all voluntary, because not everybody wants to participate in that program. voluntary in it somewhere in the description that I was reading. I don't remember the exact... There's nothing voluntary about this program. I, 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 and, I, and Brian, you want to add yellow? But I agree. Yeah. And sure, I'll tell you, that, not that, that, that 250, that one half of 1%, uh, if, you, if you think that's painful now, I hate to say it, but get ready to pay more. Because I, I, I will venture to say in a few short years, you'll see the half a percent increase to a full 1%, 2%, before you know you have unemployment. Because unemployment benefits have to go up. Correct. They're paying so much. I mean, the minimum now is what, 2%, 1.9%? That's probably going to go to what, two and a half, three? I would predict that, yeah. So, so they're going to six or seven cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. Just go over to the state for. Mm -hmm. like the yes. Um, yesterday at my job, I worked with Richard Lanier in Anchor. They just informed us that either we're fully vaccinated by the She's talking about the COVID vaccine being forced on her as an employee. So I, I'll try to repeat what you say. If they can't hear you, go ahead. Sure. Um, we were just given notice that we get fully vaccinated by the 10th, or we voluntarily resign from our position. So I would recommend that none of you voluntarily resign from your position. None of you do that. I, that's my recommendation to you. The other, the other thing that I've been very involved with is individuals um, putting in for a religious exemption. We can talk about that off, off, um, you know, outside of the meeting well, if you like. I've already provided letters from a medical physician and also from a psychologist, and they've been denied. I have to continue wearing masks. Okay. So I, I will. I'll speak for myself. I think Brian will agree. But we have been advocating for not forced vaccinations. I think he highlighted that a little bit with um, earlier with medical freedom. We believe everybody, every single one of you should have the choice as to whether you um, take a vaccine or not. Look, they're, they're not um, committing to covering any kind of um, any, any kind of side effects that you would occur or any kind of disability that you would engage in, right? So, so we believe that those, those things should be completely 100% your choice whether you take an injection into your body, that should be your choice 100%. Um, and I've advocated for that. I'm pretty sure Brian agrees with me. I'm, I, I don't think I need to, to so, so ask. You with the if you, look, look, I, I think that they're, mis, they're misnamed by anti-vaxxers. Right. Yeah. And I think that's kind of unfair. Some, there's, I know a lot of people who participate in some vaccines, but not all of them. They have concerns for some of them, some of them because of aborted fetal cells, some of them because, you know, many of them for different reasons select certain ones. And that should be your choice, right? When you go to a doctor and you find out you have a diagnosis of something, we highly recommend that you get a second opinion and a third opinion. And then you make those decisions based on what you have learned and understood and what the risks that you want to take with your own body and your own health. I, I don't advocate for anybody to feel like they're forced to do something. What choice does a child have? 74 jabs, you said? 74? Well, so there's 74 doses currently on the CDC schedule for vaccines. I think Connecticut has about, I want to say 58. But you're now required to have your child participate in in order to get a public education. Whoa. You can no longer get a public education unless you commit to getting those, I think it's 54 doses of vaccines. The CDC recommends 74. I, I'm not quite up on the numbers, but as Brian spoke to, 
Um, it's also an open door policy where they can add anything they want. They can add literally anything they want. You know, you, I, I don't know if you heard that there was two um, doses of vaccines given by, I think, Pfizer and Moderna. Now there's some of them are adding the third one on. So that's going to, you're going to see that creep continue. And you should have that choice as to whether you want to take the risks of the side effects or not. We know there's many, many reports out there that many people have had side effects from vaccines, and some have not. And some have not, maybe they'll have long-term effects. We don't know that, but those should always be your choices. Each and every one of you should have that choice. Well, they, what she said to the HR rep said was they're trying to protect their company and that we as um, unvaccinated individuals are putting the entire company at risk. <laughs> So, you know, unfortunately, the only recourse we have with that right now is through the, the, um, the, the court. And so we do have some people who are fighting, um, and we have some attorneys who are fighting. So you could be a plaintiff in that, and, and you, we can give you information. I can give you that following this. But I would highly recommend that you highlight your religious, your religious convictions with regard to the vaccines right now and stick to that well, narrative. A religion is a personal conviction. It has nothing to do with whether you're Catholic, Jewish, Protestant, Methodist. It's, it, you don't have to follow a formal religion. In the state of Connecticut, it's a personal conviction, your religion. I can help you with that. We can talk more about that offline. I can give you my phone number if you'd like. I'm sorry, sir. I don't, I don't mean to keep um, blowing you off, but you can. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just worried at some point. Try what they're doing with policing and drones. So, so both Representative Lemieux and I have been on the forefront of that. There's been, um, we had almost 7,000 people show up at the state house when that bill passed. Mm -hmm. They were completely disregarded and they stayed till that vote was taken. I want to say it was 11.30 or midnight at night. We have been on the forefront of that fighting, but remember, we're outnumbered. But we will, I will fight, as long as I represent you, I will fight for your choice or whatever it is for for, for for choices of whatever that is. But I think the fight that we've got to be ahead of us. In other words, we've got to say, okay, we know they're heading this way with the vote. What will we agree to and be there before they get there? Well, then they've had, there's many, many groups out there that are fighting. If you go on and you want to follow, I can give you the names. They, they show up. They show up with hundreds, if not thousands of people and, and try to let their voice be heard. And right now, that's the only power we have. And that in the court. We have people in the court that are fighting against um, these restrictions with regard to, it's like a quid pro quo, right? The state of Connecticut offers everybody a free public education, every, every single child. But now it's contingent. You must do this to get that. And that's where it is right now. And, and I, I, for one, don't agree with that. I will let Representative Lanou speak for himself, but I know we have both been fighting that fight for you. Uh, but on so many fronts, I mean, even when it comes to local government and choices and what works for you here in Plainfield, I know I spend a lot, a lot of time talking to Mr. Cunningham with regard to what works in Plainfield. What works in Plainfield may not work in Bridgeport. It may not work in New Haven. It may not work in Hartford. So we don't want a one-size-fits-all. We want to have local control. And I know he's been a big fighter for that, and he's pointed out to us when these things, if you will, are an overreach of government. And I know both of us, and Senator Summers isn't here today, but we've all been fighting for you very, very hard. Um, he keeps us posted on what's going on, and we will continue to have that dialogue with him. And so he, uh, and I think um, Representative Lanou in the very beginning of this when I came in started talking about issues that you may know more about them than we do. We have 27 committees in Hartford, 27. We're on, each of us are assigned three or four. So we cannot possibly be an expert on all of them. So if you know something and you want to share with us, please do that. It helps us to understand the issue better, how it impacts your life, and um, what we can do to help you. I would like to add to when you mentioned uh, the religion, you try to uh, determine uh, what your religious beliefs are. That's very, very dangerous. And that's what, that's what this uh, bill will really 
went to the heart of uh, the removing religious, religious exemption is trying to, to define what religion is. You know, the, uh, the founding fathers of our country, our, our country was founded on freedom of religion. Again, that's of religion, not from religion. Freedom to practice religion of your choice. Um, and that can, religion does not have to necessarily be to somebody where you go into a, a, a church where uh, to, uh, a set of uh, uh, beliefs or a, 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 a set church. It can be very personal, very intimate, uh, self-reflective uh, set of um, uh, beliefs. You, you have that right as, a, uh, as an American citizen. And to be able to, when we start defining it and saying, well, what religion says this, what religion says that, uh, and uh, determining what, what, uh, what, what, your, what religious beliefs are, what you're free to uh, believe in as uh, in religion, is very, very dangerous. That is extremely dangerous. Never mind uh, the attack and the assault on parental rights. The parental rights, where the, um, some government bureaucrat is, number one, is going to know better than us, where we all don't have a say as your elected representative. I'm not on that committee on the rights review. Anybody who's in the 45th, sorry, I don't have a voice. You're not represented right now on, on the uh, issue of adding uh, vaccines to the uh, any future vaccine to the schedule. Um, and uh, so it's, a, it's very, very dangerous when literally some unelected bureaucrat, um, I do not have that check on who's going to add something. Get in their communities then. If you know who's on the committee, then you have to let us know. We have to get in their community and let their community know what their representative is doing. They're being, if, they're if being we're appointed. If doing that, then we're not getting our word out. That commission is being appointed um, right now. They're in the process of appointing that commission in particular. It's for medical exemptions. Um, I had a call today with regard to that, so that is being done now. But it is, it's, it's, um, it's very frustrating, and, and, and I know that Representative Lenu and I... And they would think the same way. So why they're voting and why their representatives aren't listening to their emotions is beyond me. It, it puzzles me, but yet it does it when you listen to what's so, going on throughout. So, you know, states. we can talk a little bit about process, and the process is very frustrating, and I, I learned that very quickly up in Hartford. So um, Representative Lanou and I have, you know, we have several towns versus one representative in Hartford that might have just a chunk of Hartford. So Hartford might have six or seven representatives versus us who have several towns, right? So the more rural we get, the more spread out we are. And our voice kind of gets thinned out. We always say on this side of the river, it gets harder, but... The closer you are to Pfizer, the harder it is. Well, but I can tell you that, you know, I can speak for Rep. Lanou and myself and Senator Summers. I, you know, your first selectman here in, in Plainfield, and I know that my, my Killingly manager is, a, is a, also on the same wavelength as we are, but many of us here are fighting the fight, right? And that's all we can do because that's all we get. And so we will do that for you. I can, I can commit to that for you. What I can't commit is that we're, you know, we are only one vote. They decide up in the halls of Hartford that anyone that isn't vaccinated can't come through the door. Mm -hmm. Can't speak on the house. Can't be a member in the house. Two tiers of So I don't know how that's going to go. I mean, we have that situation. I going to go on and I mean, I hope the hell Hartford doesn't decide that they can have the power to rule over the rural area. And I can only tell you that if we get a vote, if we get a vote, we are, we are standing by you. When we have the opportunity, when, when when all of you, when all of you get together and you go up there and you want us to represent you, we come there. We come. We've been to many rallies. We have spoken for you, but really, it's you that don't get behind you. I know. We will get behind you, but we can't get up there by ourselves. If you want to fight the fight, we are with you. Um, and Naomi, to your point, yeah, we're I'm concerned. I'm concerned, but, but I will tell you, the, the um, landscape is we're outnumbered. But, but I will tell you, the good news is, is that what you don't see us doing up there is oftentimes there are bills that are very, very bad bills. 
And we oftentimes fight the fight behind closed doors and make those bad bills less impactful. And I know that, I don't know what kind of solace that gives you, but that is what we do. We, there's many tools we have in our toolbox and we do use them, but we will fight for you and continue to fight for you. And I know that Rep. Lanou and myself are both, I, I, listen, I, I, I'm a nurse by career. I didn't, I, this was not on my bucket list to do. I was asked to do this and I, I'm proud to represent each and every one of you and as long as you keep me here, I will fight for you. But we will fight with every fight we have and we, we only have so much to fight with. But we will continue to fight for you and what you believe in and the freedoms and the, the uh, independence you want from your government. And I'll just say, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the saying, elections have consequences. And I think that and the, the, this, this, this past session, you look at it from day one, from the first day we were sworn in, uh, on January 6th, we passed the rules. We have, we have a vote for them. I say, wait, we as a collective body, keeping you out of the people's house, keeping you out of the building. You would have to sign up for a, on a Zoom call to get on, hopefully get on the list. And uh, for example, in the Public Health Committee, we're going to test, the, uh, test this in. Uh, some of these bills that we mentioned, the, uh, the one on uh, pregnancy care centers, the one to uh, uh, strip up parental rights on um, the uh, mandatory vaccines. Um, it, it, was, it was restricted. Only so many people had the opportunity to sign up. If you didn't get into the, uh, the queue, if you actually call it the queue, whatever the hell that is, um, you're out of luck. You're out of luck. The, the reason these bills did not pass, even with an overwhelming Democrat majority, in years past, is you guys packed your house. And it is your house. They came to Hartford, you guys packed the building, you waited in the line, and he said, these people are serious. Now, they, they use this as an opportunity to shut people out, go, uh, go on to the Zoom, and if you, don't, if, you're, if you didn't win the lottery, if that your number wasn't picked, you didn't get to have a voice. Um, well, and, from, and, that, and those rules were put in place, day number one. So I'm on the Public Health Committee and they decided early on that they were going to limit that hearing to 24 hours. So in other words, anybody who was in the queue after 24 hours didn't get to be heard. They work for us. That's right. We don't work for them. That's right. How do they put time constraints on the people's voice? And we objected to that, but we're not in the majority. So while they're, they're making the rules, they get to decide. I think a little over 200 people were actually able to testify and almost 800 people were signed up to testify. It was a 24 hour hearing. I stayed up the entire 24 hours and fought like hell for each and every one of you. Um, challenged each and every person who came on and asked questions that wanted to take away your freedom for choice and medical freedom. Uh, but again, you know, I, I, we, we use every single tool we have in the box. <coughs> And we fight till the end, and I will continue to do that if you want to keep me here. And I know that Senator, I mean, uh, Senator Summers and Brian Lanou will do that as well.